I've all an intercity as I stopped at the gate. So anxious to enter, I could hardly wait. As I neared that city, Jesus stood at the door. Send my child into in, you are safe forevermore. Want to walk all around to see who I could see, for I had so many loved ones who came ahead of me. Walked on a little farther, who is that I did see? Why, that's the little old lady who many times befriended me, helped me in my sickness and in trouble a helping hand. Why, that's her there singing in the blessed angel band. Walked on a little farther. Who is that I did see? Why, that's Dad and Mama, who were just ahead of me. I wonder, will they know me? They have been gone so long with a smile. They remember, said my child, you're welcome home. Walked on a little farther. Who is that I did see? Why, that's the old beggar who sat upon the street. But he looks so different sitting there around God's throne with a smile. He keeps singing while the ages roll on. Oh yes, over yonder is a face I remember still. It's the old-fashioned preacher from the church upon the hill. With his Bible, I still see him standing there so many times telling us about this heaven that someday I would call mine. But I must keep on walking so many faces more, so many faces that I am searching for, but I won't have to hurry. I'll take all the time I need, for I'm here forever through all eternity. This morning, I want to take a text from the book of Romans, chapter number 14. And I'm going to begin reading in verse number 7 this morning, if you have your place there in Romans. I don't know why the Lord did this. I'm not going to question Him. I'm just going to obey. But uh, He changed my direction just a moment ago while I was sitting there. This is not what I had planned to preach today, but that's all right. don't matter what I plan, as long as we do what God says to do. It'll turn out all right. Romans chapter number 14 and verse number 7. The Bible says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Whether we live... We live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. 
Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it naught, thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give account of, our, of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Let's pray, may we? Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the reading of your word this morning. Holy Spirit, I need your touch, your filling. I need your power and unction and liberty to preach your word this morning. Father, we just want to be obedient to what you want preached and said today, nothing more and nothing less. And we pray in Jesus' name that you'll speak to hearts. We pray that you'll speak to the hearts of those that are saved. And dear Lord, we pray that you'll speak to the hearts of those that are lost, that need to be saved. We pray that your will will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. The text for the message this morning is found in verse number 12. This is the thought for the message. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let that sink in for just a moment. And that becomes quite a sobering thought. That every one of us in this building this morning, everyone that is watching over our website, every person that is on planet earth who has ever lived, who is living now, or who will be born and live one day, will stand before God. And not just stand before Him to receive some things, but each one of us will stand before Him to give account of Himself to God. Now let me say very briefly, because I don't want to get bogged down in something that the Lord's not given me to preach today. But let me say that I want you to understand that when we go to our judgment, if you're in here and you're saved, there's a judgment that you're going to. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And that judgment is, is what is specifically referred to here in this text of Scripture. But I'm not going to just limit the message to save people. I want people who are here today that may not know the Lord. You may not be saved. You may have never been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, you have a judgment that you're going to, but it'll be a different judgment. And the judgment that you'll go to is called the great white throne judgment. But whether you're saved or whether you're lost, we all are going to stand before the same person to give account of ourself. And that person is Jesus Christ. All of us in this building this morning, one day, you hear what I'm saying? All of us in this building one day, and it could happen at any moment, for the saved anyway, we're going to stand face to face with Jesus Christ. Well, I thought you said in the Word here, I thought you read in the Scripture that, that we will stand and give account of ourselves to God. Jesus Christ is God. Romans chapter 5 and verse 22 reminds us, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. 
So regardless, if you go to the judgment seat of Christ or you go to the great white throne judgment, you're going to stand before Jesus Christ and give account of yourself to God. Now if you're lost and you don't know Christ, you're going to give account of your life and your sin. You're going to have to give account of yourself, your sinful life, the sins you committed, your, all the sin of your life. You're going to have to give account of that before the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can already tell you what the outcome will be. You can plead your case as long as you like. But when it's all over and done with, the Word of God has already told us what the verdict will be. The verdict will be guilty. And Jesus will tell you to depart from Him for He never knew you, and you will be cast into the lake of fire. For those in here that are saved and born again who are going to the judgment seat of Christ, sin will not be on judgment at that, at that judgment seat. For all of our sin was bought and paid for and judged in the body of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, and they were paid for in full, never to be remembered again. Well, if our sins are paid for, then why must we go to the judgment seat of Christ? Because you see, that's our judgment and the judgment of our works that we have done since we have been saved is what we'll call into judgment. We're going to stand before the Lord and not give account of our sin, but we're going to stand before the Lord and give account of our labor and our works for Him since we have been saved. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. I want to say to those that are sitting under the sound of my voice this morning, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I desire that you make arrangements today to switch judgments. I want to beg you today to come and trust the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. Ask Him to come into your heart and to be your Savior. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins and then before Him, confess your sins, repent of those sins, and place faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. Then you'll swap judgments and you will not have to go be judged for your sins. You will not be cast into the lake of fire. You will be put into the family of God. Hallelujah! and you'll come to the judgment seat of Christ with us. I want you to make sure that you go to the right judgment. Because let me tell you something, hell and the lake of fire and eternity is a long time in an awful place to get that one decision wrong. Make your decision for Christ today. Trust Him. Come to Him by faith. Now, let's talk for just a moment here about this accounting before God. Not many people give much thought to it. You really don't hear a whole lot of messages preached on it. We hear more messages preached about the great white throne judgment than we do the judgment seat. Brother Barry Jones in Sunday school made mention that I, I quote Dr. Seitler a lot, Dr. Harold Seitler, and uh, Dr. Seitler wrote, uh, he, he wrote many books, but one a particular sermon that he wrote that was uh, placed in one of those books I have was about the judgment seat of Christ and he entitled that sermon The Christian's Hell in Heaven. Boy, that got my attention uh, when I started to read that sermon and understand the gravity and the importance of living a life for Christ, not just living like we want to because we're saved and on our way to heaven, but living a life that honors and glorifies God because one day we're going to stand before Him and give account of ourselves before God. But sadly, more people today are concerned with their bank account than they are with their accounting before the Lord. And so if you would let me for just a few moments this morning, I'd like to share three thoughts with you about our coming judgment. I want you to notice in verse number 12, our thought, our text for the morning, he says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now why does he emphasize that? Why does he emphasize that? He emphasizes that because 
He wants us to get our attention off of all these other things uh, that, that we have our mind on today and get our mind focused on living for Christ and serving Christ and loving Christ and glorifying Christ with our life. He tells us in verse number 7, He tells us to get over ourselves. He says, For none of us liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. No man is an island. No man has the right. No man has the privilege. I don't care who they are. To just rip through life, living however how they want to live, not caring about anyone else but themselves, not caring who they hurt or, 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 or how they influence people along the way. They're just in this thing for themselves. And the Lord says, I, I want you to listen to me. I want you to pay attention to me. The Lord says, no man liveth to himself. No man dieth to himself. We all influence somebody and we all have an accountability for how we live. So we should get our eyes off ourselves. He tells us that in verse number 8 that we're not our own. We're, we're not our own. We have no right to do that because he says, for whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord. Do you know whether you're saved or lost in here this morning that you are here today by God's divine creation? Amen. God created you. God uh, sparked the conception uh, at the union of your mother and dad nine months before you were born. Did you know that? You didn't get here by accident. God sparked that. God did that. And so for all the people of all the world, he says in verse 9, that for this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that He might be the Lord both of the living and the dead. You were born in sin. You were born with a sin nature. You were born on your way to hell. But Jesus Christ came into this world, died in your place, so that you could be part of the family of God. Now you think about that for just a moment. You think about what Jesus Christ has done for you. You think about where Jesus Christ has brought you from. And I want you to think about the life you're living now. If you're not saved, I want you to know that Jesus Christ died for your unconfessed sin. Jesus Christ died in your place so that you could be part of the family of God. Let me tell you something. If God never did anything else for you the rest of your days, dying for you was enough. So get your eyes off yourself. Get your eyes off your pride. Get your eyes off of your good life and your good living. You belong to the Lord. He died for you. And so he comes down to verse 10 and he says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? He says, Who do you think you are? You're a sinner who was deserving of hell and the lake of fire. And the lovely Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, came into this world to die in your place so that you wouldn't die and go to hell. Who gave you the right to judge your brother? Who gave you the right to be the judge and the convictor of your brother? He just wants us to know that those positions are already filled. The Holy Spirit of God is the convictor. God is the judge. And he tells us in verse number 10, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And then he re-emphasizes it again in verse number 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So here's the first thought I want to share with you today. Our accounting before Christ is sure. Our accounting before Christ is sure. He tells us that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Yes, you. Yes, me. We can rip through life ever how we want it. Like the old saying, we live in a free country, you can do what you want. But you'll stand before God. All of us will stand before God. And I want you to know that our judgment could happen 
at any moment. For those that are saved, for those of us that have been born again by the Spirit of God, our judgment before the Lord Jesus Christ could happen at any moment. It's not something a million miles down the road. It's not something years and years down the road. It could happen today. Are you prepared? Have you lived your life for Christ since you've been saved? Have you prayed? Have you read your Bible? Have you evangelized the lost? Have you tried to live a life that, that you pattern after the Lord Jesus Christ's life? Well, my friend, don't you know the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, chapter number 4, and beginning in verse number 1, And after this, I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as if it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which shall be hereafter. That's a picture of the rapture of the church. If that could happen at any moment, Jesus could, Jesus could come right now before I finish preaching. I mean, just in the next 15, 20 minutes that we got left in here, ever how long the Lord's got me left on this, Jesus could come. I could not finish this message. Jesus could come. And what are we going to do? Are we going to go to heaven and go ripping and running down Main Street and having a family reunion and all that sort of thing? The Bible says, and immediately I was in the Spirit. There's no time to get ready when Jesus comes. No, no, somebody's not going to run out there and look up and say, well, I wonder if that's it. I better get right with God and in here and get on the altar. Be no time for that. He said, immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper, and saw it in stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, like unto an emerald, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And down in verse number 10, it says, Those four and twenty elders fall down before him on the throne and worship him that liveth forever, ever, casting their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Where did they get those crowns? Those four and twenty elders are representative of us, the redeemed. Where did they get those crowns, Brother Mike? They got those crowns at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I don't claim to understand everything. And Dr. Martin is sitting back here and I could know what I know. I could fit in a thimble compared to what that man of God knows about the Word of God. And I don't claim to be an expert and I don't claim to know everything, but I believe with all of my heart that when Jesus comes, the first event we're going to go to is the judgment seat of Christ. Because the Bible says that when they are worshiping around that throne, in that same context of Scripture of Him coming, they've gone through the judgment seat and they have those crowns. And so our judgment could happen at any moment. But I also want you to know that that judgment of Christ is sure and could happen in, in, at any moment, but that judgment is going to yield those rewards or it's going to yield loss of rewards. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry, you are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Why do we need to take heed how we build upon the foundation? Listen, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. So here's the judgment. We go before the Lord and we stand before Him and the works of our life that we have done, they'll be put through the fire of judgment. Now don't ask me to explain exactly how that works. But He says that they're going to go through the fire the way that they were built upon the foundation. 
If you build your life with gold and silver and precious stone, those are things that are the right motives and the right attitudes and things that were for the glory of God and for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. Those are the things that are gold, silver, and precious stone. But the things that were built on our foundation by our life that are wood, hay, and stubble are the things we did for ourselves, the things that satisfied our own flesh, the things that we did to, to, to satisfy our own self. It might have been great here on earth, but when they go through the fires of judgment, well, what happens to wood, hay, and stubble in a fire? What comes out on the other side? Ash, nothing. Avoidness. So it will be at our judgment. So you consider this morning the works of your life. How will they go through judgment if judgment is today? How have you built your life since you've been saved? That's for you to decide. I'm not your judge. But I want to remind you of a couple of things and we'll move right along. I want to talk about myself first. As a pastor... I'm accountable. I'm accountable to you. Did you know that? As your pastor, I'm accountable to you. What do you hold me accountable for? You should hold me accountable for preaching the Word of God to you without compromise. You should hold me accountable for preaching to you out of the right Bible, the King James Bible. You should hold me accountable because part of my job as a, as a pastor is to prepare you for your life here and moreover for your life hereafter. I'm accountable to you to protect you from false doctrines that may try to slip into the church. That's my job. That's what I'm accountable for is to keep heresy and false doctrine out of here, keep this place clean and keep this place doctrinally sound according to the Word of God. And for 50 years it has been. And I'm accountable to you to care for your overall spiritual wellness and condition. I'm accountable to you to pray for you. I'm accountable to you to love you. I'm accountable to you to discipline you when necessary. I'm accountable to you as the members of Welcome Door Baptist Church. But I'm not only accountable as a pastor but I'm accountable as a husband and a father and a grandfather. And I'm accountable to my family. I want you to know I'm accountable to my wife to be faithful to my vows. The Word of God tells me in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. If a man ever says, well, how am I supposed to love your wife? Go look at Ephesians 5.25. If you don't understand that, look at Ephesians 5.25 and it'll tell you. I'm to love my wife as Christ loves the church. I'm to love my wife the way Christ loves me and gave Himself for me. I'm accountable to my wife for that. If I let down that vow, it won't be to you. It'll be to her that I let it down. I'm accountable to her. I stood before a man of God on the third day of October in the year 1981 at 7 o'clock in the evening. And I made a vow and a promise before God that I would love her, honor her, cherish her, and keep her in sickness and in health, in good times and bad times, as long as we both shall live. That's the end of the contract when they lay my body in the ground. I'm accountable to her. Husbands, you're accountable to your wives. I'm a father. So that means I'm accountable to my children to be faithful to my duty. I'm to be faithful to my duty. You want to know what the Bible says about the seriousness of a father taking care of his family? So many today are just so lackadaisical about it. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, 8, But if any man provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. If a man won't take care of his wife and won't take care of his family, you are worse than an unbeliever. Well, that's mean preaching. No, that's Bible preaching.
And then as a father and a grandfather, I'm also accountable to them to be an example for them to follow. They may not follow me, but I'm to be an example. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So as a pastor, I'm accountable to you as a husband, father, and a grandfather. I'm accountable to my family, but listen, as a born-again child of God, I'm accountable to God. I'm accountable to know, listen, I want you, if you don't hear nothing else in the message, don't you get this. I'm accountable to God to know and do the will of God for my life. I am accountable to Him for that. Amen? I preached a message years ago. I don't remember what the inspiration of it was or what I saw or happened that caused me to preach this message. But don't you get tired of hearing excuses? Why, why you didn't come to church or why you didn't do this or why you didn't do that. And, and everybody's really good at making excuses. And all excuses are is self-justification for our sorriness. I'm sorry. Like Brother Joe Bryant said, everybody all right. And, and maybe that was my inspiration. I just got tired of hearing excuses of, why people aren't saved or why people don't come to church or why people don't read their Bible or, or why people don't do this, that, or the other for the Lord. And I remember the title of my message was this, but what am I supposed to tell Jesus? You make all the excuses down here you want for not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You can make all the excuses you want for why you're not doing what you are supposed to be doing and why you're doing what you're not supposed to be doing. And you can justify it in your own mind all you want until you get you some kind of a peace in your heart about it. But what are you supposed to tell Jesus? Because you're going to stand before Him. I just read to you from the Word of God. Do you believe the book? The book says every one of us shall give an account of ourselves to God. So when we think about the excuses of our life and why we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, what are we supposed to tell Jesus? You see, you've got to remember that we're accountable to God to not only know and to do His will for my life, but every one of us in here, we're accountable to God to study this Bible. To read this Bible and to study this Bible, you're accountable for that. I'm accountable for that. We're accountable to God to evangelize the lost. But what am I supposed to tell Jesus? You've heard me give a testimony of a man that I knew all my life and God burdened my heart to visit him. And I argued with the Lord because I had other things to do. I was going on visitation I had people at church waiting on me, so holier than thou. Lord, I've got work to do. It's your work, Lord. I'm going out and meeting my church members, going out on visitation, Lord. I, I, I'll talk to him later. And later never came because he died. As far as I know, he died lost. Now, when I go to stand before Jesus someday, and it could be this afternoon, and he brings up that man and he brings up that situation that night. Do you think my lame excuse is going to hold any water? What could be more important for your life than the will of God for your life? And it was the will of God for me to go talk to that man that night and I didn't do it because I thought I had a, a greater work to do, a, a work for God. But when I stand before Jesus, what am I supposed to tell him? I'm accountable to God to guard my testimony. I'm accountable to God to glorify God with my life. I feel impressed of the Lord to stop. We'll preach the rest of this tonight, Lord willing. So I got a whole other side there. We'll preach that tonight. I want you to bow your head for just a moment.
Now God's burdened my heart with this for a purpose. He's trying to reach someone's heart this morning. It may be yours. There is no doubting that you're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ in judgment. There's no doubt about it. The Bible says it's sure. But first of all, do you know which judgment you're going to this morning? If you know for sure that you're going to the judgment seat of Christ because you're saved and you know that you're saved, well, that's wonderful. Praise the Lord. Are you ready for that judgment? If Jesus came this afternoon and you go stand before Him, are you ready? Well, preacher, I can't do anything about the past. You sure can't, but you sure can change your future. You sure can change your direction. Well, perhaps you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, I don't know anything about this being saved. I don't know that I've ever been born again. I just don't know. But I know one thing. That preacher hollered at me this morning a little loud and, and told me that the judgment I was going to was called the great white throne and I was going to be found guilty and cast in the lake of fire. And That's not how I want to end up and that's not how I want to spend forever. Then I want you to come to the altar this morning. We'll have someone take a Bible and show you how to be born again, how to be saved. And you'll avoid that judgment. I think that's just what the Lord wanted me to say this morning. We are all going to stand before Christ. It's sure. I want us to be ready. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the Word of God this morning. Thank you for your leadership, your direction. And now, Lord, we ask that you would just help those that, whom, whose heart you're already speaking to about their condition, whether lost or saved. It'll be now their time to respond to that. If someone needs to come and pray, someone just needs to get something right with God, something, something they're doing or not doing, they, they need to change direction, they need to get prepared better for the judgment seat than they are now. And Lord, for those that don't know you this morning, I pray they'll make that move this morning. Come down to the altar and receive Christ and become part of the family of God. Lord, you have your will and way. And we'll thank you for the outcome of this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand out.